Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing asthma and anti-asthmatic drugs. Okay, so we've now discussed the core overview of the pathophysiology of asthma. Okay, we've discussed that what happens fundamentally is that you launch allergic adaptive immune responses against some allergen. Okay, uh, which you are continuously breathing in little amounts of. So you get chronically exposed to this allergen. Okay, and what it then triggers is an allergic adaptive immune response chronically. Okay, now in both atopic and non atopic asthma, what happens is you get activation of CD4 positive T helper 2 cells, which then invade into the bronchial uh, wall, okay, and recruit innate immune system cells, okay, so they in particular recruit eosinophils, as we'll see later, okay, and this chronic uh, infiltration of innate immune system cells is what then triggers the airway hyperresponsiveness, it triggers changes to the airway that mean that now the airway will respond uh, by bronchoconstriction to stimuli that it never should have in the first place. Okay, uh, and we've discussed that what that will then cause is the non-allergic asthmatic attacks. So when you breathe in things like cold air or noxious gases such as sulfur dioxide and ozone, they will trigger non-allergic asthmatic attacks in people who have got this airway hyperresponsiveness. So that's common to both atopic and non-atopic asthma. In atopic asthma, what happens on top of that is even worse. Uh, you get not just the activation of CD4 positive T helper 2 cells, but you also get the activation of B cells as part of this allergic adaptive immune response. Okay, so when you're chronically exposed to this allergen, B cells are being activated and they are producing plasma cells which then produce immunoglobulin E molecules against the allergen basically, okay, and it's the presence of these IgE molecules in the airway wall that then means uh, that you can actually get allergic asthmatic attacks, i.e. when you breathe in particularly large amounts of the allergen, it can actually then trigger uh, bronchoconstriction, i.e. an allergic asthmatic attack. So in atopic asthma you get that and therefore you can get allergic asthmatic attacks. In non-atopic asthma, which is significantly rarer, uh, you don't seem to get uh, the IgE production against the uh, allergen which is causing the asthma and therefore you only get non-allergic asthmatic attacks. Okay, right. So in this video now what I want to do is uh, go over the prerequisite histology that we need in order to discuss the pathophysiology of asthma in more detail. Okay, so I want to discuss the structure of the uh, bronchial wall, basically. So I'm going to draw out a bronchus. Okay, so we'll start uh, on the inside and then we'll work gradually outwards. Okay, uh, so we're going to start by drawing the epithelial cells which line the bronchus. Okay, and these are going to represent our epithelial cells. Okay, so this is the lumen of the bronchus here. Okay, and the epithelial cells which line the bronchus are very tall epithelial cells known as columnar epithelial cells. Okay, and they're all going to be ciliated, so they're going to have little finger like projections. Uh, extending into the lumen of the bronchus, okay, which are going to have functions in the mucociliary escalator. Okay, right, so I'll put some of this down. So these are columnar epithelial cells, which means that they're column-like, they're very tall epithelial cells. Okay, and in particular, they are ciliated columnar epithelial cells, so I'll add that extra adjective there. Okay, and this means that they've got little projections going into um, the lumen, basically. And these cilia are going to be wafting, and they're going to have mucus on their on top of them, and they're going to be wafting that mucus gradually up the airways so that it can go up and then be swallowed uh, down the esophagus into the stomach. Okay, and that helps to keep the airways free of dirt and free of pathogens. Okay, right. Uh, so those are the columnar epithelial cells. Amongst the columnar epithelial cells, you're going to have some special cells which produce some of the mucus. Okay, and these shouldn't be ciliated, but I've ciliated all of the cells, so I can't really do anything about that now. Okay, so I'll try and pick ones that have somehow 
uh, mist being ciliated. So that one's kind of mist being ciliated as well. Okay, so imagine that these do not have cilia on. These little cells that are dotted amongst the columnar epithelial cells, and I'll just label up columnar epithelial cell. Here's a columnar epithelial cell. These green cells that are dotted amongst the columnar epithelial cells, these are uh, representing the goblet cells. Okay, and the goblet cells are involved in producing uh, some of the mucus that's going to be on the surface of the cilia, basically, and which is going to participate in this mucociliary escalator, okay, which is involved in keeping the airways clean. Okay, so that green stuff that I've now put there, uh, that's supposed to represent the mucus that's going to be on the surface of the um, cilia. Okay, and the cilia, as I say, are going to waft that gradually up and out of the uh, bronchial tree. Okay, and bacteria and dirt and other pathogens are going to come down and get stuck in the mucus and then gradually be wafted up and out. And that's a really important way of keeping the airways clean. Okay, right. Uh, then, uh, underneath all of these columnar epithelial cells, what you're going to have is a basement membrane. Okay, so all of the epithelial cells will be sitting on this basement membrane. They'll all be attached to the basement membrane, and that's what effectively stops them falling off, basically. Okay, so this is a protein meshwork that mainly uh, consists of collagen, but also consists of other proteins such as laminins. Okay, so this is the basement membrane, which we will uh, be abbreviating down to BM in future pictures. Okay, now, underneath then the basement membrane, what you have is a layer of connective tissue, okay, which is known as the lamina propria. Now, outside of the lamina propria, you then have the bronchial smooth muscle cell there, and I'm going to draw the bronchial smooth muscle cell there, and then I'll draw uh, the lamina propria, because really the lamina propria is just the gap between the basement membrane and then the smooth muscle cell layer around the outside. So this layer here is going to represent the layer of bronchial smooth muscle cells. Okay, so I'll colour this in in red here. So this is all smooth muscle cells, this layer here. Okay, and then that gap between the basement membrane and then uh, the bronchial smooth muscle cells, which I'll colour in in blue here, this is the lamina propria, and this is full of connective tissue. Okay, now lamina propria is going to be a really important site where a lot of the pathophysiology of asthma is going to occur. Okay, so let me have the labels on here. So that blue layer there underneath the basement membrane, that's going to be the, called the lamina propria. Okay, and then outside of the lamina propria, you then have the smooth muscle cell layer here. Okay, so this is the bronchial or airway smooth muscle cell layer. Okay, so whichever you prefer to call it, bronchial smooth muscle cell. Now, abbreviate smooth muscle cell throughout this video down to SMC, but I suppose I should write it out in for at least once. So, smooth muscle cells. Okay, and I'll put an extra S there. Right, so bronchial smooth muscle cells uh, there in red. Okay, right. Uh, then, outside of the bronchial, oh, and that, yeah, actually, just before we move off the bronchial smooth muscle cells, let me explain that the bronchial smooth muscle cells will be connected in rings, basically. So if I just uh, show this here, okay, uh, so if this is a bronchial smooth muscle cell, this is an individual bronchial smooth muscle cell, they have this sort of spindle shape. What happens is the bronchial smooth muscle cells are going to be connected around uh, the circumference of the bronchus or the bronchiole in rings like so. Okay, so this is a ring of bronchial smooth muscle cells. And basically the idea is that if all of these bronchial smooth muscle cells now contract, okay, what will happen is they'll all decrease in length. And you can imagine that if they all decrease in length, then the circumference of this ring of bronchial smooth muscle cells decreases, okay? And if the circumference of that ring decreases, then the diameter of that ring is going to decrease, okay? So it's going to constrict, basically. So that's how uh, contraction of the bronchial smooth muscle cells causes bronchoconstriction, okay? All right. Uh, now, the layer outside, then, of the um, bronchial smooth muscle cells uh, this is another connective tissue layer known as the submucosal layer. Okay, so the next layer I'm about to put on is the submucosa. 
okay? And this is going to contain special glands known as submucosal glands. So let me put these in here. Okay, now these submucosal glands are little tunnels, okay, with lumens down the middle, little pipes that basically empty out onto the surface. Okay, so these break through the smooth muscle cell layer, they break through the lamina propria, they break through the basement membrane, and they then release their contents into uh, the uh, lumen of the uh, bronchus, basically. Okay, so they are continuous eventually with the epithelium of the bronchus. Now, uh, they are involved in producing mucus as well as the goblet cells. So the goblet cells are the mucus producing cells that are actually on the uh, surface of the bronchus. Okay, but you've also got these glands that are hidden deep underneath which are also producing mucus which will then be uh, ejected onto the surface. Okay, so here these are these submucosal glands, so these are representing submucosal glands and they will be full of mucus which is gradually making its way uh, out onto the surface of the uh, bronchial epithelium. Okay, so this is what's known as a submucosal gland. Okay, now these submucosal glands will be amongst the layer of connective tissue which I'm about to colour in in yellow. So this next layer is just a layer of connective tissue and this is being coloured in in yellow, and this layer is called the submucosa, okay, because it's underneath the mucosa of the um, bronchus, okay, so the mucosa is considered all of what we've discussed so far, so I'll put that little piece of terminology in. So the bronchial mucosa consists of uh, the epithelium with the basement membrane, with the lamina propria, then with this layer of smooth muscle cells uh, underneath that. Okay, so that's why this layer is called the submucosa because it's underneath uh, the mucosa of the bronchus. Okay, right. Then, outside of the submucosal layer, you then have the cartilage layer. Now, in the bronchi, you do not have a continuous uh, ring of cartilage. Instead, what you have is sheets of cartilage or plates of cartilage, as they're called. Okay, so I'll show these like so. So around the outside of the bronchus, you're then going to have plates of cartilage, and these will gradually get smaller and smaller as you go down to smaller and smaller bronchi. Okay, so here are plates of cartilage, and I'll colour these plates of cartilage in, in vivid purple here. And these just add a bit of structural support to the uh, bronchus. Okay, right, so these are cartilage plates. I'll just label those up. Right, so this is the uh, histology then of the bronchial uh, wall, and we're going to need this uh, in order to have a decent understanding of the pathophysiology of asthma. Okay, right. So, we are now ready to begin our discussion of the pathophysiology of asthma. Now, as I said when we went through the outline of what we were going to uh, discuss in this video and the order in which we were going to discuss it, in this initial discussion of the pathophysiology of asthma, we are going to start from the point at which the adaptive immune response has occurred. Okay, so we're not going to start basically right back here. Okay, we're going to start here with the invasion of the CD4 positive T helper 2 cells into uh, the bronchial wall. Okay, we'll then add in the importance of IgE in atopic asthma in a moment, but we'll start off with the CD4 positive T helper 2 cells because they are important in both atopic asthma and non atopic asthma. So we'll start off with what is core to atopic asthma and non atopic asthma, and then we'll add in what is specific for atopic asthma asthma on top of that. Okay, right, uh, so we will come back and discuss much later on how you actually activate uh, the T-helper 2 cells uh, later on. Okay, right, but I think we'll actually call it there for this video and we'll begin our pathophysiology in the next video.